Uh, again, we're so thankful to have with us George and Sharon Markey, uh, two of our missionaries uh, that were actually living in Ukraine at the time all this happened, and they've got their own story that they're going to tell us um, about that. But I'm going to just uh, go ahead and pray and turn it over to them real quick. So, Father, we just thank you that we have George and Sharon here, and, and Lord, uh, we just thank you. Uh, for all that you're doing in the Ukraine. And we just pray your blessing on this time, Lord. Just open our hearts and open our ears that we might grow in our understanding, Lord, of how to pray and how to be of help. So we just commit the time in your hands now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here you go, guys. Yeah, well, good morning. Um, I'm George Markey, and this is my wife, Sharon. And uh, we lived in Kiev, Ukraine. Um, we still have hopes of going back soon. <laughs> we'll see about that. But we just want, we we're just so grateful for your prayers and um, support and all this. And we wanted just, just to share um, a little bit about what's going on there and our, and our personal stories as well. Um, this first picture I actually took um, in Bucha. Um, and this lady, uh, this grandma and her husband, they lost their home by a direct hit. But uh, it just kind of shows uh, a, a snapshot of what's going on. Uh, this invasion um, has affected everybody, but especially the elderly um, and, and the children. Um, here's a, another photo of just uh, burnout uh, residential buildings uh, and a child in the foreground. Um, and it just kind of sums up for me what's going on, just the, the, the incredible destruction. And it's affecting children. You know, they, they're two, two out of every three children in Ukraine have had to leave their homes. And um, at one point, it was 38,000 residential buildings have been destroyed, making 200,000, 220,000 people homeless. Um, and, um, but, you know, these are statistics. We want to give you, uh, just uh, share our story with you and, and, and the story of some of our friends to kind of help you uh, get your, to kind of uh, put, your, put yourselves in, her, in, in the place of the Ukrainians. Um, this is our family. We have six sons, ages um, five through 15. And um, I share our story not because it's so dramatic. Others have far more dramatic stories, but it's my story. It's the one I can share, and I'm hoping that it will help make it personal to you, the experience of the millions of Ukrainian refugees and displaced people. Um, before the war started, uh, the children and I had actually moved to a city in western Ukraine. Um, we sent our three oldest kids on ahead a few weeks earlier, and they were doing distance learning with their school. And George and I and the three younger kids were still in Kiev. We didn't think that there would be any need to evacuate ultimately. We thought that the most that Putin would try to do was consolidate his control over the two breakaway um, areas in eastern Ukraine where there has been fighting since 2014. We were wrong. Um, but as a precaution, the Sunday before the war started, on the advice of a friend of ours who is an army chaplain, um, the, kid, the rest of the kids and I went and joined our older kid children in western Ukraine. Um, I had, for weeks, I'd had two carry-on suitcases packed with our important documents and valuables and sentimental things. And the day that we decided to leave on Saturday night, I told the kids, um, put these clothes in your backpacks and anything with sentimental value. I said, don't bring all your toys. You know, toys we can always replace, but just you know, clothes and anything that if you never saw it again, you'd be really, really sad and that we can't buy, you know. And I was trying to downplay the seriousness of the situation because these were my three youngest kids, you know. And Sunday, as we're getting ready to go to the train station, I'm feeling stressed because I've got traveling by myself with the little ones, and I've got, you know, two suitcases and their backpacks to manage, and my violin, and and then a friend had come and given me a parting gift. It was a cake, um, which is a very Ukrainian thing to do, especially from Kiev, because there's a special type of cake that they make in Kiev that traditionally is like a great gift that you take when you go to another city. And so I have all this stuff. I'm like, oh goodness, how am I going to manage all this? And then my five-year-old said he wanted to take his toy electric guitar. And I was like, hey, buddy, we can't 
take the guitar, it won't fit in the carry-ons, it won't fit in your backpack, it's gonna get broken. And he started to sob convulsively. And I got down and tried to understand what was going on. I mean, he loves his electric guitar. He wanted it for like six months and then we finally gave it to him for his birthday. He said, what if the Russians bomb our house and they break my guitar? <laughs> and I almost started crying. This is my five-year-old. He shouldn't have to be worried about his house getting bombed and his treasures getting destroyed. And I said, of course you can bring your guitar, buddy. And I'm so glad I did because, you know, we never went back home again. So the Thursday morning that the war started, uh, we were staying at a uh, Youth with a Mission uh, guest room. They have a, a base in the city where we were, where we evacuated to. And I woke up about 5.30 in the morning with this powerful conviction that I needed to be praying. And I started praying for my husband in Kiev. And then this other friend came to mind who was living in another city called Ivano-Frankivsk, started praying for him. Um, later, I found out that both of these cities were next to airfields that had been hit by Russian missile strikes that morning. Um, after I got done praying, I got up and I looked at my phone. And the very first thing I saw was a message from my brother-in-law, who is a missionary in the city. It's called Ternopil in western Ukraine, where we were. He's actually here right now, <laughs> sitting there in the ceiling. Um, and it said, are you OK? And I thought, why in the world would I not be? And then I saw all these other messages about how Ukraine, the entire country, was under attack. And I just got on my face on the floor just in shock and grief and praying desperately. And while I was in that posture, I started to hear air raid sirens outside. And at first, I wasn't even sure what I was hearing. But the only thing that made sense was it had to be air raid sirens. And I went and asked other people in the base. Nobody knew what it meant. Like, is this a test? Is it real? Are we supposed to take shelter now? Do we wait? And I just got all my kids, woke them up, and got them down to the basement. And we stayed there for about half the day. Um, the sirens kept going off periodically, and I just didn't know what else to do. Um, that evening, before we went to bed, I explained what the sirens meant and what we were going to do if they went off again. Because in the morning, it had been incredibly difficult to get everyone to the basement because some of them didn't take it seriously, and they were tired. And, and so we kind of went through a drill, a verbal drill, of what, what we would do if it happened again. And I put everyone to bed, and the little guys had just fallen asleep when the sirens started going off again. And um, so I, would, I got the little guys up and went to the big boys' room, and they were already like getting ready, and we all got down to the basement ahead of all the adults in the building, I will say. We were, they, were, they were amazing. And um, then uh, someone grabbed a guitar, and someone else grabbed a cajon, and we had this full-on worship con concert going on down there. And it was great to be with the people of God at a time like that. It was a great comfort. Um, after about 20 minutes or so, they decided, well, maybe we can go back up to bed now. But I said, you know, I'm going to stay down here with my kids because some of them had already fallen asleep again, and I just thought it was a better choice for us. And it turned out everybody else thought I had a good idea, and we pretty much all of us ended up sleeping in the basement that night, except for me. I stayed in the basement. I did not sleep because... While we'd been having the day I just described, George had been having a very different day. Um, he'd been trying to get out of Kiev to come join us, but so were thousands and thousands of other people. And by the time he got on the road with, um, we didn't have a car, but he was hitching a ride with a friend, uh, there the traffic going west of the city was just a gigantic parking lot for miles. And eventually they gave up realizing it was probably safer to shelter at home than to sit on the road like sitting ducks. And they decided to try again in the morning. Um, our friend, the driver, she was staying on the western edge of the city for the night, and she wanted to get on the road at 7 a.m. Uh, however, our apartment is in the center of the city. And so George was supposed to meet her at this meeting point at 7 a.m., but the government had just instituted a curfew, and the curfew was not going to end until 7 a.m. We didn't know what the consequence, consequence would be for breaking curfew. Um, I talked to one Ukrainian who was staying at the YWAM base with me, saying, and she said, well, uh, they might just shoot you on site because they'll think you're a Russian collaborator and they want to keep you from you know, causing mischief. Other people were saying, oh, they'll probably arrest you or detain you for questioning. and." I was so, so worried for George. 
the other thing that had me worried was the American media had started to report that Russia's next step in situations like this was often to send in hitmen with lists of influential people that they wanted to take out to further destabilize the country. And one of the categories of people that the American media claimed would be on these lists was foreign religious leaders. And George is um, the supervisor of Calvary Chapel in Ukraine. So I had a very sleepless night. It was the longest night of my life. Um, I felt like I lived through a month of war just in the hours of that night. And I prayed and I prayed and sought to find peace, but I just kept facing down the possibility of George's death all night long. And what would we do? And how would, you know, where would we go next? And, and um, towards morning, I sent him a text message because I knew he was getting ready to violate curfew to go out and try to meet our friend. And I said, um, if I never see you again, you've been a better husband than I ever could have imagined. And he wrote back right away. He said, you've been a great wife too, but I'm sure we'll see each other again. <laughs> um, and he was right. Praise the Lord. God was gracious. He was able to get out of the city that morning. He was not stopped in any way when he broke curfew. Um, and uh, he rejoined us uh, in Hungary. That morning, we decided... Um, I wrote to my brother-in-law, I said, if you decide to leave the country, will you please take us with you? And he said, how soon will you be ready? And so we got our stuff ready, and I think within an hour or so, we were on the road. Uh, the, the only thing is, uh, they also have six children, um, and they have a van that seats nine people. And so we put all 15 of us in this nine-seat van and um, traveled across the mountains to Hungary. And... Uh, but God was so gracious because the children, I think, were very sheltered. They were all together. They love hanging out with their cousins, and they just thought it was a big party. In fact, as we were uh, going through no man's land, waiting in the line of cars trying to get into Hungary, they were standing outside the van just like dancing together. And so God got us safely out. Um, we were received and helped along the way by so many churches and people. I'm sure that much of the aid that came to us, I know, that a lot of the help we received was from you guys, and we thank you for your prayers, we thank you for your help. And we've just been so grateful at the way God has cared for all of our needs and has protected us. We've, we've been very fortunate, but many others have not been. And I plead with you, please do not forget Ukraine. Please continue to pray for Ukraine. The suffering goes on there, and the, it's gonna be years before the country recovers from what's happening there right now. Oh, and I will add to one thing. So as we were fleeing our, our home, I had so many questions for God because he'd given us an amazing apartment where we were ministering in Kiev. And we thought he'd set us up for the long term, that we would be there planning this church and reaching out to this community for years to come. And then suddenly it was all gone. The whole, our whole team evacuated from Kiev and it was like, it just seemed like everything had been for nothing. And I know that God can bring beauty out of ashes and that he is a master at taking what Satan means for evil and bringing good out of it. But in the midst of what was happening, it just didn't make sense. But I'm excited to report that since then, this couple who were on our church planning team They've moved back to Kiev into our apartment. It's a very unusual apartment. It's four stories in downtown Kiev, and it's got a large room on the ground floor that we were using for all kinds of meetings and ministry. <clears throat> they've moved back in there. They've turned it into a dormitory for Christian youth whom they're discipling, and together they are all continuing to plant a church in this part of the city. So God's work continues even in the midst of war. And also you could be praying for Kiev because there was just a, a rocket strike. Um, I believe it, in Pacific time it'd be probably this morning. Um, and there and it's and I, we, I don't know all the all the details, but just you know it's the situation is still dangerous in Kiev as well. Um, I just want to share a, a few more stories here. Uh, recently, I made a trip uh, to Bucha, and uh, the first photogra photograph was from there. Uh, we took in a team with Far-Reaching Ministries, it's a Calvary ministry, to get 
stories and footage and uh, to um, raise awareness. And um, as I was sharing earlier, children have been especially hit hard, right? They're, they're especially vulnerable. And um, in this car, it says um, uh, children in Russian. And so earlier on, um, people who were evacuating mistakenly thought if they put that on there that they would be spared, but um, the Russian forces were indiscriminately shot at the elderly, men, women, children. Um, and uh, But it, there's a story from that city, Bucha. Um, when we were there, there was a guy from the territorial defense that was leading us around and getting us, uh, meeting, uh, introducing us to people that could give us some, some good stories that could uh, convey what's going on. And we met this uh, man um, in the middle. Uh, he's a karate instructor. The guy on the right is, is Koida. He's a former Calvary Chapel pastor, and his wife's on the left. She's at, she, we helped her evacuate, and she's with us in Budapest. And they, they were um, able to be reunited for a bit uh, during this trip. Anyway, th- we met this instructor, and as we were approaching him, I saw Ira's eyes light up, and she recognized him. And he had instructed their children in karate. Um, but he's an incredible guy. So in, on the right, you see his studio. Um, it's in a basement. He sheltered 100, 150 women and children um, during that, you could say, the reign of terror, you know, as, as people were just being executed uh, in, this, in this town. And um, he, there's a, a, they had a, there was about a week or more where they had no water or, or um, electricity. And so one of his students would go out and get food and water and bring it back. Um, unfortunately, one time he got caught and he was killed. Um, his neighbors on the right and left were, were both executed, and and he's he's a karate instructor, so he's um, he kind of fits the stereotype. He's a very tough guy. He doesn't show emotion, but when he told these stories, he just broke down crying. And um, uh, but he shared also the story of when Russian troops came to their studio, they had gotten a tip that there were women and children there, and so they were banging on the door, and the women and children were, were panicking, and he was able to get them to be quiet and. and uh, thankfully, they left and they were spared. So, um, just an am- amazing uh, man there. Um, but much work needs to be done. The first picture I showed you, maybe I can show you one more time. Of, you know, there's so many of these kind of pictures, and, and you know, we want to be involved in helping rebuild um, along with these the people there. And this fellow stayed. He's there, working with people, helping to rebuild their lives. Um, another story is uh, so Calvary Chapel. God has used Calvary Chapel in Ukraine in a big way in evacuating people. And so, um, you know, when we, we, when we left to go to Hungary, we were wondering, how can we, how can we really help? And what's really come about is um, our connections. You know, I've lived there for 30 years. We have Calvary Chapels all over there. Um, I have connections with chaplains, with different churches. Um, and so we've, we were able to really establish a network uh, from the get-go of people on the ground we begin writing and asking, who's, who, you know, who's still on the ground? We want to help you and, and let, you know, let us know your needs. And so one, that, one people that reached out was through the Chaplains Network were these churches in Mariupol, or near, I'm sorry, near Mariupol, and it was in Dnipro. And they said that the greatest need right now is vehicles because we have drivers. We're waiting for Mariupol to open up so we can go in and take aid and, and bring out people. And so we started just, you know, getting out the word and uh, many many churches responded, you know, and just helping us get vehicles. And so uh, this, they began um, operations, and um, it's an interesting story. You see that red car in the middle. They took a similar car. It was the first trip. Uh, and went, they went in, went past a Russian checkpoint, uh, and they met a, a stranded car on the way, it helped them with fuel. And so these two cars went in, and the first trip back, they took in about, I think, 18 to 19 people in these two little cars. And the next day, all these drivers um, were ins- who were inspired by their bravery said, we want to go in too. And so in the end, we were able to get out about um, over 1,000 people out of Mariupol and a, and a bunch of aid. Of course, that door is now closed, um, and it closed abruptly for them. You know, they, their drivers, uh, several of their drivers were arrested and put in, in Russian prisons. One car was shot up, and the occupants were killed. Um, so they... they and so they began, um, when the East was getting hit, they began doing evacuations from there. And as far as I know, they're, they're still doing that. Um, and we're just giving you snapshots. God has done so many amazing things through uh, Calvary Chapel and other churches. Uh, but here's another amazing um, story that Sharon's going to share about. It's about um, medication. 
Yeah, so when the war started, um, George has a very large family and most of them are missionaries around the world. And four of us ended up as refugees um, as a result of this war. And then a number of others came to Hungary just to minister to us and help us figure out what we were doing. And um, one of George's sisters, um, Melanie, came and her heart is broken for Ukraine. And even after she went back to the country where they're serving as missionaries, she continued to do everything she could to help Ukraine. And she was in contact with a friend who is diabetic. She's Ukrainian, but she lives here in the States. And she said, Melanie, people are dying in Ukraine because they don't have insulin. Is there some way we can get insulin to them? I know a guy who's going into hot spots, and if we, I know if we could get him insulin, he would take it into these hot spots. And so Melanie talked with um, Pastor Phil Metzger of Calvary Chapel, San Diego. They've been funneling a lot of money to us for the relief effort in Ukraine and said, hey, could we, could we have $25,000 to buy insulin? And... Uh, and he said, that sounds like a really good project. Sure, let's do it. And so they got the, the insulin. They got it into the country. They got a bunch of it to this guy, and he got it to the places where it needed to go. Some they gave to a doctor who was able to distribute it through you know, medical channels. Um, and one thing led to another, led to another. And this mother of five who works full-time as an English teacher and is a missionary in a different country suddenly found herself, I call her the medicine woman of Ukraine. <laughs> and... Um, to date, uh, through, through Calvary Chapel, um, we have provided $145,000 worth of insulin to Ukraine. And one shipment um, arrived in the country right after the city of Chernigiv was liberated from Russian forces. And these people had, were desperate for so many life-saving things, one of which was insulin. And we actually had a connection through a friend in Calvary Chapel, Kiev, to a man in the Ukrainian government who is insulin dependent and he's from Chernigiv. And he had the great joy and honor of personally delivering the first shipment of insulin to this city right after it was opened up. And he was so impressed. And as a result, he's, Calvary Chapel has his full trust and he's ready to help us in any way that he can. Um, because of how we were able to respond to, to like urgent requests for insulin so quickly. Uh, we attracted the attention of a, one of the world's main producers of insulin, and now they've taken over supplying all of Ukraine's hospitals with insulin. Um, there's um, a, a friend of ours, a Ukrainian, he interfaces with them, and when there's a big hospital order that's needed, he just contacts them and they provide it. And we continue to provide for field hospitals and for you know smaller smaller orders like that. But God has just positioned churches, including Calvary Chapel, but churches all over the country. They're, they've been positioned to be the first responders in this crisis, and they're doing an amazing job. And people's hearts are very touched because so many people have been helped by churches, and they're it's making their hearts open to the gospel. Another big thing we, we had, God has used to Calvary Chapel has been to get in um, food, too. And um, it's, that's kind of not, necessarily, not so needed now as many of the big organizations are now really um, have, have got their distribution down. But early on, earlier on, and uh, we were one of the main ones getting food in. And um, we had a warehouse. We have a warehouse in Krakow. We were running 18-wheelers from that warehouse to um, Ternopil to the warehouse there. And then all of the contacts on the east, you know, and all these hotspots would come and get them and, and deliver them. Um, but but now we're actually connected now more to the big organizations, so we're able to uh, we're start to relocate those funds now to other needed projects, like getting better vehicles to run these supplies um, to, to to the east. Um, also, and, and we're helping refugees outside of Ukraine. Uh, we're, we're in Budapest, like I mentioned. So just one among many projects is. Uh, f locating Ukrainian families that are outside the capital city that have less access to help, who are isolated because of culture or language. So we, we, we uh, have compiled a list of about 60 to 70 families in over 20 cities in Hungary and started to deliver food to them. And one of the most um, greatest things for them was just to hear Ukrainian. So 
we're going to continue this, and we're trying to link up with local churches and do some maybe do some um, concerts and worship nights to bring Ukrainians and local churches together so they can be helped on a local level. Because you know, our goal is to not just be doing it, but helping facilitate the help by bringing together resources and needs. Um, and that's just a small part. I mean, there's much more we could tell, but um, many more stories that need to be told. But if, if we uh, set up a website, it's called, um, you can find it at partner.bridgeua.org. And we've put together a lot of what Calvary has done in the different cities outside of Ukraine, ways you can help and give, uh, ways you can connect with certain projects. Um, so you can go onto that website and check it out. Um, if you want to give online, um, we could give to Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. They've, you know, they'll get those funds where they're needed. Calvary SD also, um, Calvary San Diego. You can send me an email. Um, we're, we're taking groups also. We're, we're, we're helping coordinate teams, short-term teams, to help um, volunteer Hungary, Poland. Um, we're probably going to start in Ukraine as, as you know, security allows. Um, and uh, there's, we want to be part of the rebuilding process. Um, so there's also a lot about that as well. So we want to thank you and, and um, turn it over to John. Yeah. Awesome. I, you might be out of time, but if, yeah, if you have we're a question. running close. But man, this has been so worth it. And of course, George and Sharon are here. You know, so uh, find them. Johnny's back there. I let's see, Johnny. Maybe you could raise your hand again. And Stephanie, there's Pam and Kristen, and they're all part of the team. Uh, our missionaries as well. You know, involved in Ukraine for so many years and. So uh, if you want to know more about it, you know, find these guys and ask about it. And, and again, as uh, they mentioned, we also have like a Ukraine relief fund here at the church that you can give to that. You could give to George and Sharon or any of these guys um, any way you want to do it through the church or um, Calvary San Diego. We're all cooperating together. You know, kind of all our funds are pooling and uh, helping with these different projects. So um but I think our time is pretty much done. But maybe George and Sharon, um, give us a couple like major ways to pray for Ukraine. What would be like, can you give us three main ways to maybe pray for Ukraine right now? Major prayer requests. Well, first of all, pray for end to the war. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> suffering continues and, and, and uh, people dying. Um, just pray for that, for the end to that evil. Um, Secondly, let's see. Um, yeah, just for salvation of people. I mean, there's an openness that we have not seen, I think, since the 90s. You know, of course, the desperate needs, right? So as um, churches and others have are meeting those needs and being providing that community that people so desperately need in Ukraine, outside of Ukraine, and the family. So just pray for that. Pray that people be brought into the family of God through the, the love that they're experiencing. Um, and I'd add, can I, yeah. and I think a final thing I would say is pray that God would touch the hearts of those who have the resources that Ukraine needs, touch their hearts to, to give, to help. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I guess awesome. those two things. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me pray. Let's yeah. pray for these guys. And so, Father, we do. We just thank you for George and Sharon and Johnny and Steph and, and Pam and Kristen that are here with us. But, Lord, we just also remember all the different ones over there of our missionaries and just the family of God in Ukraine, Lord, both missionaries and Ukrainians and all those from the surrounding countries. And we just pray, Lord, pour out your spirit upon your people, oh God. And Lord, give wisdom and guidance and direction for these days and these challenges. And, and Lord, we do pray for an end to the war. Lord, we just ask, and we know many are praying around the world and I've heard from Calvary Chapel guys in Japan, they're praying for an end to the war. And we unite our hearts with the hearts of all who are just asking, Lord, bring a stop. There's nothing too hard for you. And so we just lift that cry to you once again. And, and we do pray, Father, for just um, blessing upon your people, those who are suffering, those who are without hope and are broken and hurting today. Lord, meet them in their need. Lord, draw them to yourself. We pray for those who know you. Lord, just strengthen them in their faith in you, Lord God. And, and Lord, those who don't know you, we just pray that they would be drawn to you. That through uh, this tragedy, we just pray that millions 
of Ukrainians would come to know you, O oh God. That, that you would just work in such a gracious and wonderful and powerful way. And then, Lord, we do pray that there would just be a flow uh, to the Ukraine, Lord, just out of the resources of heaven, Lord, through your people. Lord, you know the things that are needed this day, Lord, just food and medicine and those sorts of things. But, Lord, we know this is going to be a need that will extend out for years. And, and we just pray, Father, that your people would not grow weary in doing good, but, Lord, just have confidence that in due season they'll reap if they faint not. May your people continue to pray, Lord, for Ukraine and give towards Ukraine and, and support and help. And, and we just uh, ask all these things now, Father, in, in Jesus' name. Amen.